In other words, Newton thought that gravity was a force that acts instantaneously across any distance. And so we would immediately feel the effect of the sun's destruction. But Einstein saw a big problem with Newton's theory. A problem that arose from his work with light. Einstein knew light doesn't travel instantaneously. In fact, it takes eight minutes for the sun's rays to travel the 93 million miles to the Earth. And since he had shown that nothing, not even gravity, can travel faster than light, how could the Earth be released from orbit before the darkness resulting from the sun's disappearance reached our eyes? To the young upstart from the Swiss patent office, anything outrunning light was impossible. And that meant the 250-year-old Newtonian picture of gravity was wrong. If Newton is wrong, then why does the planet stay up? Because remember, the triumph of Newton's equations come from the quest to understand the planets and the stars, in particular the problem of why do the planets have the orbits that they do. And with Newton's equations, you can calculate the way that the planets will move. Einstein's got to resolve this dilemma. In his late 20s, Einstein had to come up with a new picture of the universe in which gravity does not exceed the cosmic speed limit. Still working his day job in the patent office, Einstein embarked on a solitary quest to solve this mystery. After nearly 10 years of racking his brain, he found the answer in a new kind of unification. Einstein came to think of the three dimensions of space and the single dimension of time as bound together in a single fabric of space-time. It was his hope that by understanding the geometry of this four-dimensional fabric of space-time, that he could simply talk about things moving along surfaces in this space-time fabric. Like the surface of a trampoline, this unified fabric is warped and stretched by heavy objects like planets and stars. And it's this warping or curving of space-time that creates what we feel as gravity. A planet like the Earth is kept in orbit not because the Sun reaches out and instantaneously grabs hold of it, as in Newton's theory, but simply because it follows curves in the spatial fabric caused by the Sun's presence. So, with this new understanding of gravity, let's rerun the cosmic catastrophe. Let's see what happens now if the Sun disappears. The gravitational disturbance that results will form a wave that travels across the spatial fabric in much the same way that a pebble dropped into a pond makes ripples that travel across the surface of the water. So we wouldn't feel a change in our orbit around the sun until this wave reached the Earth. What's more, Einstein calculated that these ripples of gravity travel at exactly the speed of light. And so, with this new approach, Einstein resolved the conflict with Newton over how fast gravity travels. And more than that, Einstein gave the world a new picture for what the force of gravity actually is. It's warps and curves in the fabric of space and time. Einstein called this new picture of gravity general relativity. And within a few short years, Albert Einstein became a household name. Einstein was like a rock star in his day. He was one of the most widely known and recognizable figures alive. He and perhaps Charlie Chaplin were the reigning kings of the popular media. People followed his work, and they were anticipating, because of this wonderful thing he had done with general relativity, this recasting the laws of gravity out of his head 
There was the thought he could do it again, and they, you know, people want to be in on that. Despite all that he had achieved, Einstein wasn't satisfied. He immediately set his sights on an even grander goal, the unification of his new picture of gravity with the only other force known at the time, electromagnetism. Now, electromagnetism is a force that had itself been unified only a few decades earlier. In the mid-1800s, electricity and magnetism were sparking scientists' interest. These two forces seem to share a curious relationship that inventors like Samuel Morse were taking advantage of in newfangled devices such as the telegraph. An electrical pulse sent through a telegraph wire to a magnet thousands of miles away produced the familiar dots and dashes of Morse code that allowed messages to be transmitted across the continent in a fraction of a second. Although the telegraph was a sensation, the fundamental science driving it remained something of a mystery. But to a Scottish scientist named James Clark Maxwell, the relationship between electricity and magnetism was so obvious in nature that it demanded unification. If you've ever been on top of a mountain during a thunderstorm, you'll get the idea of how electricity and magnetism are closely related. When a stream of electrically charged particles flows, like in a bolt of lightning, it creates a magnetic field, and you can see evidence of this on a compass. Obsessed with this relationship, the Scot was determined to explain the connection between electricity and magnetism in the language of mathematics. Casting new light on the subject, Maxwell devised a set of four elegant mathematical equations that unified electricity and magnetism in a single force called electromagnetism. And like Isaac Newton before him, Maxwell's unification took science a step closer to cracking the code of the universe. That was really the remarkable thing, that these different phenomena were really connected in this way. And it's another example of diverse phenomena coming from a single underlying building block or a single underlying principle. Imagine that everything that you can think of which has to do with electricity and magnetism, can all be written in four very simple equations. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that amazing? I call that elegant. Einstein thought that this was a, one of the triumphant moments of all of physics and admired Maxwell hugely for what he had done. About 50 years after Maxwell unified electricity and magnetism, Einstein was confident that if he could unify his new theory of gravity with Maxwell's electromagnetism, he'd be able to formulate a master equation that could describe everything, the entire universe. Einstein clearly believes that the universe has an overall grand and beautiful pattern to the way that it works. And so to answer the question, why was he looking for the unification? I think the answer is simply that Einstein is one of those physicists who really wants to know the mind of God, which means the entire picture. Today, this is the goal of string theory, to unify our understanding of everything, from the birth of the universe to the majestic swirl of galaxies in just one set of principles one master equation. Newton had unified the heavens and the earth in the theory of gravity. Maxwell had unified electricity and magnetism. Einstein reasoned all that remained 
to build a theory of everything, a single theory that could encompass all the laws of the universe, was to merge his new picture of gravity with electromagnetism. He certainly had motivation. Probably one of them might have been aesthetics uh, or this quest to simplify. Another one might have been just the physical fact that it seems like the speed of gravity is equal to the speed of light. So if they both go at the same speed, then maybe that's an indication of some underlying symmetry. But as Einstein began trying to unite gravity and electromagnetism, he would find that the difference in strength between these two forces would outweigh their similarities. Let me show you what I mean. We tend to think that gravity is a powerful force. After all, it's the force that right now is anchoring me to this ledge. But compared to electromagnetism, it's actually terribly feeble. In fact, there's a simple little test to show this. Imagine that I was to leap from this rather tall building. Actually, let's not just imagine it. Let's do it. You'll see what I mean. Now, of course, I really should have been flattened, but the important question is, what kept me from crashing through the sidewalk and hurtling right down to the center of the Earth? Well, strange as it sounds, the answer is electromagnetism. Everything we can see, from you and me to the sidewalk, is made of tiny bits of matter called atoms. And the outer shell of every atom contains a negative electrical charge. So when my atoms collide with the atoms in the cement, these electrical charges repel each other with such strength that just a little piece of sidewalk can resist the entire Earth's gravity and stop me from falling. In fact, the electromagnetic force is billions and billions of times stronger than gravity. That seems a little strange because gravity keeps our feet to the ground, it keeps the Earth going around the sun. But in actual fact, it manages to do that only because it acts on huge, enormous conglomerates of matter. You know, you, me, the Earth, the Sun. Um, but really at the level of individual atoms, gravity is a really incredibly feeble, tiny force. It would be an uphill battle for Einstein to unify these two forces of wildly different strengths. And to make matters worse, barely had he begun before sweeping changes in the world of physics would leave him behind. Einstein had achieved so much in the years up to about 1920 that he naturally expected that he could go on by playing the same theoretical games and go on achieving great things. And he couldn't. Nature revealed itself in other ways in the 1920s and 1930s. And the particular tricks and tools that Einstein had at his disposal that had been so fabulously successful just weren't applicable anymore. You see, in the 1920s, a group of young scientists stole the spotlight from Einstein when they came up with an outlandish new way of thinking about physics. Their vision of the universe was so strange, it makes science fiction look tame, and it turned Einstein's quest for unification on its head. Unification. Unification. Led by Danish physicist Niels Bohr, these scientists were uncovering an entirely new realm of the universe. Atoms long thought to be the smallest constituents of nature, were found to consist of even smaller particles. The now familiar nucleus of protons and neutrons orbited by electrons. And the theories of Einstein and Maxwell were useless at explaining the bizarre way these tiny bits of matter interact with each other inside. 